if he joins us later. For this meeting, the Triton School Committee is convening remotely via Zoom using the information posted on the district's website identifying how the public may join. If you are personally attending by video conference using your device's camera, please be aware that others may be able to see you. Committee members and administrators, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the district's website with the agenda posting unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. Each meeting, to each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All right, and I will read aloud the vision statement. We are a community of learners known for our unwavering commitment to meeting the needs of all students. Through the adoption of best practices and our active partnership with families in the wider community who are united in supporting the development of engaged, successful, responsible, resilient learners, students will be well prepared to be ethical, empathetic, and contributing citizens. All right, so welcome everybody. <laughs> I always hate the legal part. I gotta get that out of the way first. Um, so I'm Nurse Wallen. I chair the school committee um, and we have all nine of our school committee members on here tonight. Um, I know we have a lot of people who may or may not have joined us in past meetings. Um, one of the things that um, Kim is going to do tonight is actually kind of go I don't want to say start to finish, but take us a little bit back into history so that people who haven't um, been part of the meetings in the past kind of have the full picture. Because one of the things that I'm finding as I'm talking to people is that they have part of the story, but not the whole thing. So they may have read a news article about the initial state guidance that came out, but they don't really have anything since then. Or maybe they've watched the school committee meeting, but they're kind of you know, back where we are, were sort of at the beginning, or, you know, they've, uh, they've got part of it, maybe a more recent part, but don't have the older part. So Kim's going to take us through a real quick um, rundown of kind of the, where we're at from, uh, from sort of the beginning of this, this discussion. Um, we are missing the superintendent tonight. He is taking a very well-deserved vacation. Um, it was one of those, when can he take time? Because he definitely needed to take time and this seemed like a, a good week to do that. Um, so he will be back with us uh, next week. But uh, for tonight, we are wishing him a very, very well-deserved break. Um, and hopefully he is stepping away from his phone and his computer and actually uh, taking that time to decompress so that when he comes back, he is uh, full fresh and ready to go again. Um, I, uh, just a note, so the next thing we're going to move into is oral communications from the public, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, I just wanted to note that, um, that there are essentially two parts to this meeting. The only part where the public can participate is the oral communications from the public section of the agenda. The, um, the rest of the meeting, uh, our uh, association tells us that it should be treated of, as a meeting of the board in public, not a meeting of the board with the public, because otherwise we can end up with um, what's called open meeting law violations, which is the law that all um, public boards have to operate under in Massachusetts. And, um, um, violations can be expensive, so we try to steer clear of those. Um, so I'm going to ask you if you are a member of the public and you have something to say, so a statement, you can give those during the oral communications from the public section. If you have questions, um, there are a couple of ways to get those answered. If they're a reopening question, there is uh, a new reopening. Well, so first of all, there's um, on the Stay Connected site, there's a frequently asked questions and all of the previous communications that were sent out um, from the district about reopening. Uh, if you have a question beyond those, there is an email reopening at tritonschools.org um, and reopening questions can go there. If you have um, comments or feedback that you want to provide and you want those to go directly to the school committee because in the long run we are going to be the ones that are um, approving the final plan um, that will go off to the to the state um, department of elementary and secondary education uh, you are welcome to send that to school committee at tritonschools.org um, and that all, all the members of the school committee will receive that the only one that will reply is me as the chair um, again so that we don't run into issues with the open meeting law. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Assistant Superintendent, Kimberly Croto. Okay, thanks. Okay, and I'm going to um, share a screen, the presentation with you. So bear with me for a few minutes while I pull this up.
Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. Um, as Narissa said, as more people come into the meetings, I think it's really important for them to understand the, the process and where we are in the process and what type, type of guidelines we have been receiving along the way. Um, so I will begin. All right, well, there we go. Okay, so um, we have a working group that is charged with providing the safest um, environment to bring the students back in the fall. And so the goals of this particular working group are to identify and address the challenges, as we know there are many, with the reopening of the schools, to develop a comprehensive plan to address the academic and emotional needs of students, which we know is going to be great based on um, the situation. And then obviously um, to strengthen and build the capacity of teachers to integrate technology into school and or remote learning. Because as we have learned from the past, that we certainly had some areas that we needed to address and make stronger within our remote um, learning environment. So when we received um, the guidance on June 25th from the state, um, they basically gave us a set of directions that said, um, this section provides a checklist of key actions districts and schools should take in the coming weeks to plan for all three fall reopening models. So we were given the challenge of opening all, um, excuse me, of developing a plan that had three different um, scenarios. So within this section, they gave us a checklist. And the first one that they said we needed to establish was planning teams. And we did that. And those planning teams consist of a teaching and learning team that was focused on the in-person learning, um, hybrid learning, and remote learning. That is um, a team that has administrators on it, teachers on it, um, students on it, parents on it. So it's, it's, it's pretty um, inclusive as far as who we have and the different uh, viewpoints that are, are brought forth. Right now it's at 61 team members, so we do a lot of breakup breakout rooms with um, some very targeted agendas. Um, in addition to um, the teaching and learning team, we also have um, a team that's focused on just the, um, the safety. So that team is really looking at, um, and it's a group of nurses as well as Kyle, and they're looking at the safety that is within the building, safety that happens as the students are in their environment, as well as different precautions to help uh, mitigate the, um, the disease and other things um, attached to that. Um, the third team is the technology team. We're looking at the, um, devices that were used in the spring to see if there were enough people that had access to um, to um, devices as well as um, Wi-Fi and at this point through our survey we found that pretty much I would say 99% of the people had um, access um, to Wi-Fi and devices and if they did not they actually requested that they had some of the resources and the learning um, brought to them in paper so we were able to do that as well so we have the teaching and learning team um, the technology team the safety and wellness team um, we also have one that that's um, focused on special ed and um, student support. So, oh, and transportation too. So there's a there's a there's a whole uh, set of groups or teams, if you would, that are really working together around the clock to develop different pieces of this plan. So moving along. Um, so basically, after planning teams, the uh, Department of Ed based gave us guidance as well around communication plans and structures. They felt that it was very important through this process to make sure that we keep the general community, teachers, parents, um, community members, all up to date on the information that was coming forth. So that was the second um, item that the district wanted us to do. They wanted us to do um, a family survey throughout the learning, uh, excuse me, the planning process, which I'll get to in a second. We've only done one at this point, and we have one um, that will be sent out next week. They also wanted us to start early on thinking about what type of training our teachers, parents, and students needed in order to be successful um, 
in the fall, as well as specifically focusing on our special ed population, our EL population, and our 504 students. So again, these are all the different steps that they outline for us early on on that June 25th date to say, as you are beginning this planning process, here are the different um, components that you need to address as you're going through this journey. So um, our first, as far as the, um, I guess I should pause for a second and I just wanna make sure there are no um, questions at this point on this part. Okay, so our first meeting with a large group of teaching and learning folks started actually back in June 25th, um, which was very aggressive as far as beginning, and, but I thought it was necessary because I felt like we really needed an opportunity to um, kind of decompress about what had just happened and our experience and also um, identify some areas of need that we felt that we could improve upon. Um, up to date, to this point, as far as progress that we can um, say, um, we've certainly heard a lot of different ideas and um, creative solutions, but where we have landed so far in our progress is we have um, definitely developing in-person plans with a focus on social and emotional well-being. We heard loud and clear from um, um, the state and we knew as well that our students really are going to need to those social and emotional issues um, and fears are going to need to be addressed uh, before any learning can occur. Um, in developing the in-person return plans that support academic gaps, we also know that there will be some academic gaps and we want to be able to identify these gaps early, long, early on so then that we can address them. Um, and one of the tools that we're going to use is iReady and that will be implemented for reading and math for a benchmark assessment, K through eight. We also um, said that we were not going to give that benchmark assessment um, for the first uh, two weeks. That that's not to say that academics will not be taught, but we want to make sure the kids are in a good place socially and emotionally and, and before that we start into those particular areas. Um, at the high school level, the content areas are working on developing their own assessments to look at the areas that they may need to um, reteach or teach for the first time as far as gaps. Um, today, we were able to um, come to agreement on a common teaching and learning platform that would be implemented district-wide so that the, the, um, the difficulty of jumping from one platform to another between grade levels or schools would be limited and we landed on Google Classroom. That does not mean that teachers will not be able to put some of their favorite instructional sites on there, but for the parents, it's just the ease of going to one place where they can access the um, assignments, they can look at some of the grades and really um, become a partner in their child's education along with the school. Um, we also, I would say one of the biggest challenges that we have been um, working through with a lot of input and a lot of different plans out there is a hybrid model. Remember back at the beginning, we have to come up with three different models for the state, the in-person, the hybrid, and the remote. Um, right now, we have um, decided on an A-B rotation, which would not be the week, but it would be something similar to a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, and a Friday. So sometimes if you're in the A group, you would be going on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And if you're in the B group, it could be Tuesday and Thursday. So that's we are with a direction that we have decided that at this point right now where we are, that um, is the route that we're going. We hope to get that information um, finalized as we finalize the plan so that we can um, give parents enough time to plan. <coughs> and we're also looking in the possibility of um, seeking um, our, some of our community um, agencies to um, look into different childcare options on some of those remote, remote, do, remote days. Um, the other thing that they have been working on, I would say at the middle school and high school, and they are, I would say 70% done with it, <laughs> is coming up with a consistent schedule so that as you're going through your in-person day or your remote day, that the, um, the days are very similar and they mirror each other. And so that you don't have that inconvenience of one day 
<clears throat> when you're doing remote, your math class could be at nine o'clock and the next day it could be at 11 o'clock. So really trying to create that sense of um, consistency through everything. And I would say that's probably one of our biggest <clears throat> overall themes as we're working through this plan. As far as um, the other checklist on that document from the state, they said we needed to look at um, our operations and facilities. And at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Kyle if he could talk a little bit about the progress that they have made on the operations and facilities front. Absolutely, so a little bit of background on that too, uh, just for the purpose of uh, filling people in. Uh, so this group was charged with taking a look at the protocols and the logistics associated with implementing the three plans uh, from a facilities and operations perspective. Uh, in, the DESE, in the guidance that was issued by DESE, they, uh, there was an Appendix B that actually really nicely uh, itemized out different areas that the group should take a look at. Uh, that's those different areas or the itemized points are cleaning and supplies, uh, facility management, capacity, ventilation and food surface. Uh, so for each of some of the big ticket items uh, here on this slide, we have uh, some goals that have been achieved already. Uh, again, these are just the ones that have been fully achieved. Uh, there are certainly a number uh, that have been, there's been significant progress made. Uh, first and foremost is the initial PPE order. Uh, so that was placed with uh, vendor WB Mason uh, and those Items that we purchased were those recommended by DESI, uh, masks, uh, uh, hand sanitizer, disposable gowns, a uh, number, of, number of different items there. Uh, and the quantities that uh, were purchased were based on the, a spreadsheet that DESI developed. Uh, it's a 12, week, 12 weeks worth of supplies. Uh, so in talking with WB Mason, uh, some of these supplies are more readily available than others. Uh, I know actually the hand sanitizer, uh, a portion of it's gonna be delivered tomorrow, which is pretty exciting. Uh, there are other items that have a bit more lead time. Uh, we've been trying to get one gallon uh, containers of hand sanitizer, uh, but the vendor had assured us that it's at most two weeks on any one of those given uh, items uh, to play it safe We've also lined up some additional vendors where we know we can get those supplies right away. Uh, but this initial PPE order was placed from a, a bulk perspective to try and get the best possible prices. Uh, if we need to get an item right away, they are available, but they just come at a greater cost. Uh, so we're certainly monitoring that. Uh, the, another item that's been completed uh, is the hygiene barrier uh, that are being installed at the administrative offices and the nursing suites. Uh, that's part of that uh, facility management uh, item in the Appendix B or the desk seat guidance there, uh, where we've had the principals, the nursing staff, uh, take a look at the facilities, how we can go about implementing uh, the specifics, the protocols uh, associated with these COVID isolation rooms. Um, so we are working with a, a local vendor actually on installing those hygiene barriers that should begin tomorrow. Uh, the, on the topic of ventilation, uh, we actually every single year have semi-annual inspections of our HVAC systems at every single facility. Uh, talking with our facilities director uh, at the end of these inspections, we're provided with a deficiency report uh, and since that, those inspections occurred, I think uh, it was back in April, uh, we've followed up on every deficiency uh, that was listed and those have since been corrected. Uh, and also another item there, those electrostatic disinfectant sprayers. Uh, those were a challenging one to acquire uh, during the, uh, the tail end of the spring. We had actually ordered those a while ago, but uh, based on the needs of the country as a whole, uh, those had actually been uh, taken by FEMA, I think a few times, so we were able to get our hands on that. Uh, but moving forward, there's certainly a number of other uh, items we're working on. This, this group met on Thursday. We're scheduled to meet again, or we're gonna uh, meet again next week as well uh, to continue working on the logistics. Uh, 
uh, associated with these plans. Great. Uh, certainly take, I don't know what's the best format to take questions as we go or at the end. I was going to say, I think now is a good time. Um, yep. And if I can ask you, Kim, can you just, there's a couple of people that if you could mute them. Yeah. They're just muted. Uh, right. and, and Linda raised her hand. So I'm just going to. Just going to say. Stop so sharing this. Yep. There we go. Linda? Hey, Kim, I, have a, I have a question about the iReady. I know last year we were looking at modules to test math. Are we going to be able to test math in the yes. iReady? Yes, right now the plan is to um, use iReady for math. And I can just add a, a, another side note to that that might work out to our favor. As you know, the, the state is looking to contract different um, um, in, uh, instructional platforms or benchmarking platforms, which if they do, we could get a discounted rate, if not for free. And they're actually um, considering using iReady as one of those platforms. So we're already there. That's already in our um, wheelhouse. The teachers have been trained. This, for the, the majority of the students actually have already used it before. So um, that would be one obstacle that we would not have to face and because um, we're already using it. So it would be for reading and math, absolutely. Okay. And we would use okay. that to do the intervention groups. Yep. Okay, I have another question about the um, HVAC. I was wondering how often that, it says semi-annual, but what does that mean? Uh, twice a year. So we do, uh, the most recent one was, uh, the most recent inspection was performed in, I think it was April. Uh, and as part of that, they uh, take a look at the full operational, um, um, I'm blanking on a word here, but uh, looking at how that, system is operating, uh, looking at the filters, things of that nature. Uh, so that is twice a year. Okay, thank you. Yep. And I should uh, elaborate on that too. There, uh, in terms of our uh, looking at the DESE plan or uh, the, the logistics associated uh, with each of the three plans um, and the functionality of these systems, making sure that it's uh, bringing in air and taking out that air, uh, talking about uh, our facilities director, my understanding is that I, I had, because I'm not an expert in HVAC, I had to use the example of a air conditioning unit in uh, my vehicle. So some, when you want the AC to be really cold, you hit that button to circulate the air. Uh, so it, pull, it draws in internal air, continues to cool it. That's not how, the systems are designed is my current understanding and we're gonna confirm this as well, whereas it's a constant drawing in outside air and then pulling that air and uh, disposing of it. So the inspection is for the filters as well, semi-annual, correct? Correct, yep. Okay. It's a, a multi-point inspection. Thank you. Got it, Linda? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and Kaylee is next, uh, just by way of explanation. Um, Kaylee is our student representative to the school committee. Every year we have a, um, a student representative who sits on the school committee. If we're lucky, uh, it's the same person multiple years in a row. We would definitely be lucky to have Kaylee multiple years in a row because she has been a rock star over the last few months. Um, so take it away, Kaylee. <laughs> well, it's definitely looking like you'll have me for two more years. Yay! <laughs> um, I have one question for Kim and I have one question for Kyle. Uh, Kim, when you had said that, I know you had said on the elementary level, you were, there's a plan that the first two weeks are going to be for the social and emotional needs of students. Is that also going to be applied in the high school? Yeah, so the, the uh, and it might be more than two weeks. It depends on how those first two weeks go. So they talked a lot about community building, giving kids time to, as best as possible with the new environment to socialize and get caught up with friends and teachers and reconnect. That's, like I said, that was our number one priority. And also like building in time in our schedule and in the day to do that, because we know that that has been something that has not been available. Um, and we really wanna make sure we have a good start of the school year. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and then Kyle, my question was, you had said that I believe it was WB Mason was supplying our safety equipment such as hand sanitizers. 
have we heard from them if the FDA recall on over 60 brands due to methanol has affected us shipment wise or not? Um, I can follow up. That's a great question. I'll, I'll follow up on that for sure. Because I know like 60 brands just got recalled. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it, Kaylee? All right. Um, Paul Mayette, you are up next. I just wanted to ask a quick question to confirm that system that you just described pulling in the fresh air and expelling the the stale air is that in place in all buildings and in all parts of all buildings right so certainly uh, that my analogy may have been oversimplifying it as well <laughs> but um, so that's one of the challenge so there are rooms in the certain buildings I look at our facility director's office for example there are no windows in that uh, in that room uh, we looked at how what the intake or the air coming in and the air coming out so that was well circulated in that environment uh, part of what our custodians have been doing is uh, touring the facilities to see are the because some of these systems while fully operational and fully inspected we want to make sure that they're circulating the air as best as possible uh, so with that in mind are there certain rooms where if we open windows will that draw in air better uh, are there other means where we can promote airflow uh, in certain uh, parts of the building so uh, while our hvac system is fully operational that's part of what our uh, current process is right now part of what we're doing right now of uh, taking a look at the different areas of the building to see what the, the airflow is like thank you Paul has his hand up. The other. I was trying oh. to myself. <laughs> I know. <Paul> <laughs> um, so, Kim, um, yes. are, with the planning the social emotional piece in those first couple of weeks, are we just at the stage of mapping that out right now, or are we starting to think about what that's going to look like in the classrooms? So we actually are start, starting to map that out. That's been a big priority with the teachers too. So they've, again, I think I talked about this last time, really starting to, to lay the groundwork in um, August where we have the um, teachers connecting with their students and showing pictures of what it might look like in the classroom of having open houses but invite and scheduled times if we can possibly do that um, and then also having training we have um, somebody who we've consulted with over the last couple of years with social and emotional and she would be doing um, trainings for parents on what do, what's good for parents to do to get them ready to come back and the teachers and obviously some students so um, they are absolutely in full force and it's not just going to be you know this 20 minutes during the day we're going to focus on this it's going to be activities that are going to be integrated throughout the day so that it's they're meaningful and then based on how the kids respond and the progress that we're making so that folks feel um, safe and, and less anxious moving forward at that time with the, the more um, rigorous academics. Thank you. You're welcome. All good. All right. Anyone else on the committee? Seeing none. All right. I have a couple of questions myself then. Yep. Um, Kim, could you talk quickly about um, why the AB Daily? Because I know there are a lot of different hybrid options out there. Definitely have seen them discussed in other districts. What What was the deciding factor or what was the discussion around um, going AB Daily versus a weekly or? So weekly, they didn't want to be not, they didn't want a week to go by without seeing the kids. They felt like that was going to defeat the purpose of bringing them back if there was this large span in the, um, or lapse of time. So they really, really wanted to get them in. At, they wanted to get them in as much as possible and as frequently as possible. They looked at like an AA model, but then again, you have a large gap of time where the kids potentially will not be in front of you. So they, they felt like that AB model would be the best. Um, there was something else. Oh, actually, one of the students, Kaylee, you would appreciate this, where they were talking about a another um, having some type of professional development or um, 
planning session for the teachers on half of one of the days and having what they called a transition day. And um, they were thinking of a Friday. And the, the student rep said, no, because that would mean we would, we would put off any work until the last minute and then we would be pushing it out at the end of the week, which really isn't good either. So they really wanted those alternating days to be able to check in with the kids. So it was definitely based on um, the educational um, experience for the students. But there were a lot, I can't tell you, that was probably we spent the most time and we reviewed many different options. And there were certainly other options we could have gone with, but either we didn't have the facilities to do that, it would have required tons of busing, and uh, we really did try to limit the disruption for families who needed um, child care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and one other question um, on the slides, and maybe you're coming, did you say you're coming back to the survey to talk yeah. more about it? Yes. Okay. Right. I'm going to leave that for down the road then. Okay. Um, Kyle, I have a couple of questions on, um, on kind of the work that you've been doing on facilities and PPE. Um, I went through the DUSI guidance and there's no, um, no standards that I can find on kind of the the level of HVAC that you want, I guess, but it looked like the CDC had some for, for buildings other than schools, but not necessarily for schools. Do we have a good, I mean, it's, it's one thing to have our HVAC, you know, up running and, and going, but I think it's another to say, yes, this is sufficient for a situation where we could, you know, potentially have, um, you know, the virus in our buildings. Do you have a sense as to whether there's any standard or kind of level of requirement on that or even a recommendation? And if so, if we, if the, the district systems meet that? Right, no, perfect question. So it's been, I think, taking a look at the HVAC systems, the functionality of our existing systems is the first step in the process. Is that in working order? Second step in the process for sure is does, do our existing systems, uh, are they sufficient to, to meet the needs of uh, some of these, um, uh, the guidance that CDC puts out as being able to uh, mitigate uh, COVID-19. Uh, so that's, that's the next step in the process. And part of what um, like I was alluding to with uh, Paul is, taking a look at the different rooms, the different classrooms, the different, uh, those rooms with no windows to see, okay, what, what is the air circulation like in those uh, particular spaces? And then the next step, just like you said, uh, which we will absolutely be doing is saying, based on guidance from these different sources, what's our confidence level here? Um, can we ensure the safety of students and staff? Uh, what can, if the initial answer is no, what types of uh, what types of equipment can we bring in? Uh, I've heard people mention air purifier. I can't attest to and the functionality of these air purifiers people have been talking about, or if they are, um, if they would mitigate COVID. But it's just that type of thought process. What can we bring in uh, to make sure we have a, a healthy environment from a uh, ventilation and airflow perspective? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I guess the follow-up question to that is, what do you think the time frame is on that? Because summer months are ticking away. Yep. So we, oh, exactly. So we had our, um, we have been working on, we had our first facilities and operations subgroup meeting last week. We have another uh, one this week in the interim. We had a few different, between uh, those two meetings, we had some items that we had been working on. So that's a a top priority, I would say, within the next week or two. I would say okay. I'll be talking with them tomorrow to make sure we have that as a top priority, uh, for sure. Um, it was, Fair. I don't want you to think we had forgotten about it by any means, yeah. uh, but yes, that is a top priority within. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, and I'm sure you saw this question coming from me, but can you tell me how much the initial order was for PPE? <laughs> both both quantities and <laughs> we haven't volumes. known each other that long but i i did see that one coming um <laughs> so it was right around sixty seven thousand dollars okay all right and that was everything that we had talked about last week the ten thousand gowns the fifty five thousand masks all that is included in there exactly yep so we had uh the gowns uh face shields 
mass. I actually went down uh, to Woburn today to take a peek at the uh, disposable paper masks to make sure where we were getting a very good price on those and we were ordering such a significant qu quantity. Wanted to take a peek at them in person to make sure that they were, you know, we, uh, we didn't want to end up in the news as one of the, like you see with the gowns, uh, the arm in the wrong spot. So, uh, yes. Exactly. All right. And that'll cover us for approximately th three months, we're thinking, based on Desi's. That, yeah, exactly. That, that order was developed based on the Desi 12 week guidance. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I see another couple of questions pop up. Um, Aaron? I did want to ask him, I'm sorry, I'm go, going back to what something that Narissa said prompted me to think again. Yeah. So when you were talking about Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then switching the next week to Tuesday, Thursday, Thursday um, does it make more sense to stay Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, and have at-home learning on Friday so that families can get some consistency as opposed to the flip-flopping so that they know that they need childcare on the op those two days because if they're if they're going through a situation where they're trying to figure out who's going to watch their kids on the days that they need to work and that they're at home doing homeschooling it's easier to do that on a consistent schedule than it is to flip-flop it every other week so but i think that would be if i'm understanding correctly that would mean that they were out of school more than they would be in school no yeah, I guess technically it would, but it would at least be consistent. Yeah, and I, I'm and, just I'm curious yeah, about the, the thought process. And that was the thought process because a lot we were thinking that too. Like, how can we make this more predictable for families and work schedules? And so, um, if we were to go and have like a flex day or have everybody remote, right? We could do certainly do that on a Friday, and then that would mean that everybody then would be short a day as far as. Um, it would be, yeah, it would be just two days of in-person with three days remote. And they just, they just really wanted to get the kids in front of them as, as often as possible, even if that, that does mean it's going to be a little bit tricky as far as the schedule with parents and work. Okay. So then do you think it would make sense that the kids do Monday, Wednesday, and every other Friday, as opposed to doing it and flip-flopping the week because then you you're not for like i'm also thinking about people that are going to forget which week it is so if you do monday wednesday friday week one and then monday wednesday week two and the other group is doing tuesday thursday week one and then tuesday thursday friday on week two do you know what i'm saying i do Just to so try and keep like two consistent of the days Kaylee's got her hand based on what I said. I know, I know. I'm, tr I'm trying to write this down to, <laughs> to look at that. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly look at look at the A-B schedule and what would be best. Um, but like I said, I, for us or for the working group, it was basically their priority was to try to get the kids in front of them as often as much as possible in a hybrid setting. Um, okay. But, and we did talk sense. about that. Yeah, yeah. So, but I can certainly put that out there again. We just want to kind of let people have a sense of what, where we're going, at least at what direction, so that people have time to, to make arrangements or plan. And then we also talked about, we haven't finalized this yet, but um, looking to find which way of organizing that A-B schedule would be best for um, parents. So having them, the, the siblings go the same day. So you're not trying to juggle two different schedules, uh, especially if it's younger kids and, and they demand some type of um, attention and some child care. But we certainly, we, the other thing we were thinking of, and, and this still is kind of being tossed around, which I guess would, would um, satisfy that particular issue as far as having a similar schedule is doing an a b schedule but then having a half day on wednesday so but how would you do that because you'd i'm just trying to think because i know some schools are doing like an a b wednesday's a, a remote learning class for everybody else very similar to what you said but it wasn't on a friday it was a wednesday but they're doing a half day On that one, would you see every kid on the Wednesday? So that's you'd what see the half in the morning is, and half in the... Yeah, you could do something like that, or every other week you have a, an extra half day in the week, which would get confusing too. 
Agreed. Um, so I'm just going to note again real quick while we're, while we're here that we cannot interact or answer questions from the public uh, during the meeting, that this is a meeting of the school committee and the administration. Um, we will have a public comment period. It, I think, you know, ideally it worked out this way. We'll have public comment after Kim's presentation before we get into kind of the true discussion discussion for the night. Um, it will be a situation where we hear from the public. Um, it's not a situation where we can have a discussion. That's not the way public comment works for the open meeting law. Um, and there are, I'll give them again at the end of the meeting, but there are two email addresses that you can use to send either um, questions or feedback. Uh, and so I don't, I, Again, like we did before, I kind of want to stay in the same topic. So I'm going to say I see hands from um, Kaylee, Linda, and Paul. Were those in the same line as the questions that we just heard from Erin? Paul's is. Okay. Kaylee and Kaylee's is. All right. All three of you. All right. So I'm going to go. I've actually seen Kaylee's hand first. So I'm going to go Kaylee first, and then Paul, and then Linda. I understand the whole having a Monday, Wednesday, and then every other Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday makes more sense for families and parents in particular. But personally, I feel as though that would be just creating an unequal access problem because if you have students that are receiving this instruction on a Monday consistently, they're going to be getting that instruction and then taking that home to work on it as opposed to the students that would always have in-person instruction on Tuesday, because they'd be working with last week's instruction and then going in the next day to catch up with it. So I know from my viewpoint, I think fl flipping, I know it makes less sense for the younger grades, but from an older standpoint, it just, with the consistent Tuesday, Thursday wouldn't be the same level of education as a Monday, Wednesday. Good point. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, Paul Goldner. Um, within the AB rotation, um, you were just touching on how are you grouping. Um, have you thought about um, using sort of our resources to help families make small pods of three or four families that would be assisting each other with childcare, assisting each other with helping students through the remote learning? Um, if parents are working, um, having their children home is going to mean they're unavailable for childcare, unavailable to help with the remote learning. Creating the pods of families that are working together on that could help both support the remote learning piece of the hybrid model and the childcare piece of the hybrid model. We have not, Paul, that's actually, that's a great idea. I can start, we have not finalized how we would be grouping or, or developing those cohorts, but I do know organically people are already starting to um, make some arrangements where um, they're going to take their kids and watch their kids on one day and, um, and doing that back and forth. So I'm trying to find out where there is. It's Erica Geyer. It's Erica Geyer. <laughs> Erica, where are you? Ah, I see her. Okay. Just to follow up on that, if it happens organically, unfortunately, what will happen is that you know, I might make an arrangement with my neighbor down the street and then my, you know, my daughter might in a day and my neighbor's daughter might be a B day. So if we can get in front of that and utilize our resources and help families make those pods and then yep. group accordingly, that might be helpful for families. Yeah, I think that the sooner we can get um, confirmation that we're going to go with the A B schedule from now from at this point forward, this is the the recommendation from the schools and the opening group. I, it obviously has to go to Brian and the school committee. But the, the sooner we can get this out, um, and we'll talk about some of the deadlines as far as um, what Jesse has come out with as the end of July. I want to say it has to the, the plan has to be sent to. Desi, but it's not supposed to be released to the public till mid August, which doesn't make any sense because then how do you get the approval from the school committee if it's done without anybody knowing? So again, there's 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 definitely some issues, but you know if we can even informally say here's the direction that we're going, um, 
at some point, it just gives people more time to do that. And then us more time to come out to say, hey, we have a couple different ways that we can organize this to support families in their child care issues. And, and like I said, I also um, am working through reaching out to some of the, um, the community facilities that um, do daycare after school to see if there's any potential for them opening up their doors during these remote days. So. So really trying to work through some of those issues, but that's a great idea, Paul. We also have um, Megan Ober at the high school and uh, Patrick are reaching out to some of their uh, colleagues to find out because of, I would say the majority of the schools are going to some type of AB schedule and just learning from them, how are they organizing it and structuring it so that they can maximize the resources out there for families. Well, was that the end of your question? Yes. Awesome. Um, Lin uh, Linda and then Kaylee. Kim, has some thought been given for the remote learning, uh, um, like in the library or in the cafeteria or the gym, to have more kids staying at school and possibly doing some of the remote learning right at school? So I think right now the goal is to have um, our most at risk students in school all the time. Um, students who are on IEPs or have some other um, concerns where really their um, remote learning is going to be compromised at home because of the services that they're receiving. So I would say if you add those people into the numbers and going with say like a six foot distance as opposed to a three foot distance, we're going to, we're going to need to use that extra space. And, um, but again, on that point of trying to reach out to parents who are really in a bind, working with them and, and other families to try to find some alternative um, settings for them to support their kids. No, I appreciate the group Linda? and everything that they're trying to do to accommodate everyone. Thank you. All right, uh, Kaylee. I know we had said in a discussion a while ago that there was a talk of bringing in, reaching out to local alum that are college students going into the education field to be substitutes. Yep. Have we thought about sending a mass something out to alum just to see if they a still live in the area or like not even that, but just to see if they're still in the area, if they'd be willing to either babysit or help tutor during the online days or something along the lines of that? So you mean for the families themselves? Or, yes, so if we reached out to alum and then got information back from them, if anyone is doing remote learning this year or not going back to their physical on-campus schooling, if they'd be interested in helping out local families through this? So I think you could do, like we have a community listing of all the different agencies and, and so forth. Um, just because of the liability issue, Kaylee, I'm not quite sure that, that we would be able to manage who would be going into homes, what they would be doing in that extent. I love the, the idea of um, kind of alum helping out the community and giving back. I think one way that we can open up that opportunity is to get them to come in and, and do some subbing, which we did um, actually resubmit a post for our, um, additional substitute kind of getting on that as quickly as we can and also did some posting within some of our um, the local colleges nearby okay. but I like the spirit and then along the lines of I know Paul had said the different cohorts of family grouping I pers I don't know which way I was a little bit lost in that which way it was going but if we did that I personally would think it would be better to just collect information from the families that were willing to work alongside one another and put that into one big list because there's going to be some families that can't or don't really want to participate. Or if we also made the groups ourselves, there'd be a lot of conflict between students that we wouldn't even know about, I feel like. Just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's always that fine line um, with this remote learning of what we can do outside of school to support it without um, crossing the kind of that, that that public education line. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't. Do, hang on. I see you, Aaron. But uh, Linda had her hand up first. I just not don't know if it's a leftover from. Oh, it Linda. might be me. Linda? Is it a leftover, Linda? 
Yeah, I'm done with my question. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. my, Thank my you. over here. Go ahead, Erin. So I just wanted to comment on um, Paul's uh, um, Paul's addition to this. I would be very cautious about asking families to create these cohorts and then dictating to us which kids need to be going to school together, as in because they're going to be in a cohort outside the school. We may find ourselves in the situation that um, we're, we're answering to some people as to why certain kids were allowed to be in this cohort where others weren't allowed to be in a cohort and put other people in the position where they're um, not able to get into a particular cohort with someone because they submitted it too late. I think it's um, something that if we're going to split the kids up, that we should name the days and then allow the cohorts to, to the um, outside of school things to happen uh, organically that way once you know what group you're in as opposed to asking them to tell us who they need to be paired with. I think that the logistical nightmare with getting the kids into the school on the same day as their kids is going to be tough enough right now to have that happen to try and figure that out that if we add into the this the additional element of which family needs to be with which family on particular days that it's going to cause a bigger headache. So I'm just going to, if I can, I'm just going to stop that there and ask him to take that back to the working group because that is so far into the details that I, I believe that's out of our purview. We do policy. Um, we're, you know, and, and part of this is going to fall into policy, definitely some of the safety aspects and the, the general like big guidelines. But as far as the way that that's happening, I, I don't believe that's something that the school committee can take on providing guidance on. So Kim, would you mind taking that back to the working group and yeah. having yeah. that discussion there? Yeah, and just, I do know that this is probably after deciding the hybrid model and people coming away with like an A, B schedule, like I said, the from what I've heard, the majority of, of towns are, the next question is how do we divide up that A, B schedule? So um, we're not alone in that, that um, decision. All right, so do you want me to keep going, Narissa, or is there any other questions on this that I need to? Well, I was gonna ask Paul Goldner, is his hand still a leftover too, or is that a? That was just Drew's thought. Okay. So leftover? Thank you. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Kim. So keep continue? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Okay, so um, I left, I think, where Kyle was talking um, about the, the progress of his group. One of the other checklist items for our pre-planning group for the Department of Ed was uh, planning for training. Again, based on the spring experience, we knew firsthand that teachers were unprepared, parents were certainly unprepared, and even some of the students were unprepared for that type of remote learning that was uh, put on them. So we really wanna make sure that in advance, starting um, in August, that we have a number of different series, both um, optional and certainly ones that people, as far as teachers or staff, will um, have to attend. We still have not heard from the Department of Ed regarding regarding any um, change in the school calendar. Um, they are continuing to say proceed as you would with a regular school, but also with kind of that side note, here's what we're looking into. So again, um, we are not waiting for them to come out and tell us, we are just actually starting to plan. So um, some of the PD sessions that we actually already have on the calendar and um, uh, contracted out to just internal people as well as external people is um, social and emotional PD for parents, staff, and students. What is some of the signs you should be looking for when your children are feeling anxious or getting stressed out? Because often kids don't come to you and say, hey, I'm a little anxious. Usually it's through their behavior, their words, um, their actions. And so just some things to look for as um, we head back to school and even prior to that. As I said, that technology PD, not just on how to use a Chromebook, the basic logistics of it, um, but also kind of the instructional and then communication platforms for parents, staff, and students, and then give them some, some time to practice that. We know that 
as you are taught something, especially with technology, it's one thing to have somebody lean over your shoulder to say, hit that button, scroll down, and here you go. But it's really about providing that kind of practice where they're alongside with you and they're checking in. So it's not a one and done TV. That's the one thing we know from past experience absolutely does not work. Um, there is a huge amount of safety training that will need to happen within the schools. The nurse talk, the nurse spoke about this today as they are <clears throat> working through plans about training staff, um, especially those staff that are going to be with um, students where there is not going to be some social because of their needs and so they really need to be um, geared up um, to make sure that they are safe in the environment in which they work so also just educating the parents too about signs of, of the um, the virus that if they see their their um, kids having these particular symptoms here's what you should do and then even working through some of the details um, the nurse was saying today that the days of just sending kids down to the nurse are not going to exist anymore so there'll be different protocols where um, folks who go into the room are going to have to sign in so we keep a record of which body or which adult has been in that room. If you're thinking that you want to send a, um, a child down to call in advance to, to kind of triage if, if that truly is um, a situation where you want to send um, that student down. So again, they are thinking at a level of detail that goes far beyond what these guidance have actually offered at this point. Um, you'll see in my later slide that they're waiting for additional guidance and, and kind of a checklist in that safety training area. But I can tell you from what I heard today, they are on top of this even before anything has been released as far as internally at the school level, um, not the operational level that uh, Kyle speaks to, but just in the school level, what, what has to happen. Um, and last, as far as uh, PD training, is that we realize we are going to be limited in what we can do with um, our instructional time because of the, the structure and the setup of the room. So really focusing on teaching techniques to engage kids while they're in those rows and um, we're also trying to find guidance if we do have a small group of, say, three kids with masks on that are socially distanced at least six feet apart, can those particular kids um, participate in some type of group discussion? And we, again, have not, ha we don't have clear guidance on do they still have to stay um, in their seats and, and looking forward. So, um, knowing that the instruction is going to change, we want to make sure that we can provide kids and teachers with the best tools, um, and um, we need to do that through some really good quality PD. So that's just to say we've kind of we we kind of we have actually planned for that PD, and that's in the calendar, and that should be released because there will be some um, sessions that parents can attend. I would say by the end of um, August. I'm oh, not August, July. So uh, this is just to show you how much we information we don't have. So within this guidance, the checklist that the Department of Ed said, here's are the things that you should be working on right now, which is really what I wanted to give you an update is that we are working on those particular pieces that we were told to work on and then some, but this is not even a full list of all the things that they intend to issue guidance. So you can see that, um, you know, they talk about handling COVID-19 positive cases is in the school committee community what does that mean what type of shutdown is it I've heard anywhere from two days to two weeks to the whole school so we do not have any clear guidance on that from the Department of Ed um, they the Department of Ed is really looking like I said earlier to support our efforts in developing or um, accessing some some really high quality remote learning resources and I believe that is another reason why some of this information has been on hold. They want to make sure as we're moving forward with these plans that we have the best resource possible to work with. If people are jumping the gun and, and actually creating plans and they don't have all these resources, I don't know, maybe they're a school district that has enough money to um, buy everything they possibly need from additional devices to online subscriptions to some of these um, really high quality resources. So again, they're, they're cautioning districts to hold off. We're, they're working behind the scenes to get these contracts with these um, particular vendors so that we have more resources and options to offer our families and our students. Um, 
facilities and operations. They have not gave us anything particular about entry and cleaning and ventilation, procurement, food distribution, signage. So all of these things, again, we are working within um, our own um, scope and sequence, but we do not have any final guidance for them. We are still one of the probably the biggest frustration um, that I can see is that transportation piece, because if you think about um, what could potentially be co very costly is is you know, trying to figure out what type of hybrid model if we had limited amount of money for transportation and then of course the athletics the extracurricular activities and electives what are the guidance for that uh, and again the the academic calendar which we still do not know where that's going so um it's a moving target. I think, you know, I pulled this right from the guidance from June 25th to July 10th. The June 25th, they basically said our goal is to safely bring back as many students as possible. And if you say you can't fit them in, we're going to send out a team that's going to measure and, and find a way forward. So they backed down from that on July 10th. They actually shared out a Q&A, which I think was super helpful. And to our surprise, there was a question that basically said, um, can, do I have to send my child back? And previously on June 25th, the understanding was that, yeah, you don't have an option. Where July 10th, they came back and basically said, parents, caregivers can choose to send their children to an in-person school or keep them at home learning remotely. So again, that was a probably 180 turn that, we, that came out um, last Friday, I think it was, among some other information. As far as the plans, um, on June 25th, they, they stated that districts and schools would be required to submit their comprehensive opening plans, again, with all three models, to DESE in August. Now they're basically saying they want it in, excuse me, on, on July 31st, but this is the, the, the problem. They don't, they're requesting that we hold off on announcing any final decisions about what reopening will look like for the fall into your district. So until early August, which does not give a lot of um, planning as far as for parents, it certainly does not um, provide the opportunity to share and get the final approval from the school committee. So again, trying to work with their guidelines is like, trying to, um, I don't know, throw darts in the, in the dark because it, it's been a little frustrating to say the least, but, um, but we are moving ahead on certain things that we think are absolutely certainly uh, important. Um, one other thing I do want to say, and I feel like I, um, the other thing that I do want to say, uh, talk about uh, is the plan. Paul, I know we don't have anything specific um, Regarding the template, they said late tonight, tomorrow morning, um, but I can tell you they did list what the components were on that plan, and um, they said there was going to be an executive summary in the plan, then Brian would create a general letter from um, the superintendent. We would have an in-person learning model, what our hybrid learning model would look like, and then what our remote learning model would look like. Um, we would need to have an out of school uh, time plan so that we can show that these, what these kids are doing at certain hours of the day so that again, that's consistent. It's not, well, two, day, two hours for remote or well, you can do 30 minutes of remote. It's gonna be a consistent plan with a set amount of time. So they'll want that. Um, they wanna know exactly what we're putting in place for the range of, um, as far as student supports. They're gonna want our professional development plan, which again, we could, we've already done. I would imagine we're gonna to continue to add to that as needs arise. And then the last thing which I thought was interesting, and I, and I wasn't part of this meeting, so it's just listed here, is that it says certification of health. So I'm assuming, and Kyle, you might be able to answer this better, because we don't have the information, that they are going to send somewhat of like a final checklist where districts are going to have to go through each item and um, attest to the fact that they have run all of these system checks and they have everything in place in order to, to reopen this school and, and basically say, you know, it's safe. Is that something? Is that I, your agree. I agree with you on that. Yeah. Okay. 
I can't, I, I want to elaborate, but you, you explained it perfectly. Yeah. Okay. So again, waiting for that, there's a lot of checklists coming and I do, I feel confident that we will be able to check some boxes on that list um, before we even see it. Um, the other thing that I said I would address, um, Narissa, is the survey. Um, obviously for, for good reasons, Brian's wanted to hold back on that survey just because the information is changing and there is danger to um, giving information out to parents that is limited or could, could, could change, right? So again, some of these districts who pushed out these plans really early um, are now having to pull them back, say, you know what, we actually have more resources or we can't do this like we thought we could. So now scratch that and we need to do something else. So that in of itself is causing some anxiety um, among that, that those particular um, school districts. So our survey will be sent out um, next week. We've already started to draft some questions based on what we've seen for surveys. Um, and, and based on some, we think some um, solid information that we have moving forward um, instead of just some hypothetical questions or situations. So that's gonna be sent out next week and that'll help us uh, even fine tune our plan even better so that July 31st we'll have more to present. Um, and I think Paul's hands. <laughs> I, I know, I'm gonna get to questions in a minute, but I just wanted to make one clarification because poor Kyle, I'm sure has enough going on right now. Um, the list that you read off is actually the final, um, the final uh, thing, Kim, it's not the initial one. So hopefully you'll have significantly more time or not significantly more time, but extra time beyond just two weeks for that, um, for the health and safety certification that has to go on. That'll be August at some point, not the July 31st date. Thank goodness. I like to, I like to see him sweat, Narissa. <laughs> <laughs> what a friendly office environment we have. <laughs> a little jazz. Always up for the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> I know you are, Kyle. I know you are. All right. Um, so lots of questions going on. So I know Maureen has her hand up. I'll give her a chance first since, uh, since she hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet this session. And then we'll start going down through everybody else. So go for it, Maureen. Well, I, I just before we go into everybody's questions, I know we taught, we mentioned public comment, Narissa. We haven't actually opened that up yet. Correct. I want to finish this. Okay. Every, all the questions on Kim's, Kim's deck, essentially. Okay. Then everybody should have kind of as much of a full picture as we can give, right? We're not gonna be able to give a full picture. If you're designing one plan that's gonna have three models and any of those models could come into place in the fall, right? It, it's not gonna be a full picture of what's gonna happen, but they're gonna have at least a, as full of a picture as the rest of us have, so. Yeah. Okay, no, thank you. And yeah. Kim, I, I don't really have any questions at the right at this moment, but you did a, thank you for that presentation. I think that was really helpful. And it, you mentioned it's like, you know, throwing darts in the dark, but I would add you, throwing darts in the dark with a blindfold on because <laughs> there are so many things that are just still so unknown and it's it's very frustrating so yep all right other questions i feel like i saw other hands before mr lees so um my question deals with the term survey um, and I'm addressing this question. Not, not, it's not so much a question, but a statement to my fellow school committee members. We saw the email from legal, um, the legal counsel for the school committee, and it addressed a question that I didn't really pose. And I just want to repose my question to all of you so that um, the record is sort of set straight. I, I'm not interested in surveying the staff, okay, for Triton about their thumbs up or thumbs down for each of the plan. My goal on a survey for the staff of Triton has always been about who is um, medically able or emotionally able or not able to do one of the plans. And I think as the employer for the staff and, and for the TRTA, we have an obligation to know if people aren't going to be able to perform their jobs in one phase or another, depending upon which plan the school district comes up with. So I just wanted to be very clear. It's just about getting advance notice for people that may not be able to participate in different plans. It's not about who wants to do what. So I just want to make that clear. Thank you. 
I thought that was, I'll have to go back and read, read the guidance, but I thought that was specifically what it had addressed. So no, I'll it, go back. It wasn't. The guidance from council was about simply sending out a survey about staff's beliefs about the different proposals. Oh. That's how I read it. Okay. I'll stick around with Brian on that one when he gets back. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, other questions on this? Any other questions before we go on? Um, so I have one, Kim. Yeah. Uh, the, the obviously the, the biggest switch that I saw in here was that um, that there is now a you have to have remote, um, which is you know a big difference. Like no matter what model you have, right? You have to provide a remote option for families that want to stay remote. That's a 180 degrees um, from what what we saw in the June 25th guidance and also what has been clarified with the superintendent calls, because I know I personally have asked this question over and over again, as I've gotten it from different parents that, you know, no, this has been clarified in the calls. If you have a medical issue that would require you to not attend in person, then, you know, then there will be a remote option for you, but otherwise the remote option is not open to you. Um, what is, how are we notifying families? What's, what's the plan? So I think, again, I, I want to say it was Friday or Thursday or late Thursday that this, this Q&A came out and we didn't, I didn't have any warning. Usually there's sometimes there's some information that gets leaked out. So when we saw it, we were all surprised. And then um, after that particular question, it talks about the Department of Ed coming up with their own remote platform that families can opt into if they're not comfortable um, for whatever reason attending the school in the, in the full return or the hybrid model. So my understanding now or my assumption now based on my crystal ball um, is that 100% families can have the option of going remote if they want to. We obviously are obligated to create that within our um, plans, but I do think that they will, if they decide at the beginning of the year, if they want to go remote, have that opportunity. They, the state did say that there would, for, it would be a small cost to the districts. I don't know what that means, but they would basically, um, again, have all these different instructional platforms and oversight, make sure it's aligned to the Department of Ed. We would use some of our teachers to help monitor, track attendance and such. But again, those plans have not been released. So if there are parents out there who were under the impression, as I was last week, that that was not an option, it, it, it seems to be based on the Q&A uh, from the state that um, it is an option. And I would imagine let's hope by the end of this week, there'll be some more information about that because I think that caught everybody off surprise, everybody off as far as a surprise. And I will update our Q and A. Um, we started a Q and A and so that needs to get updated so people have um, the, um, the information firsthand, especially those who are considering homeschooling their kiddos. I was just gonna say, I would even, possibly suggest an email going out because I think that there are definitely families who yeah. have been looking at homeschooling options and obviously that's a incurred cost so to the family we don't want them to be incurring that cost if they don't need to yeah and I would want to see what that the state plan looks like before they make that decision too because you want to be an informed consumer whether you know it's free or not but yeah absolutely okay any other questions on anything that um, was included in Kim's presentation. Paul Mayat? Yeah, just to follow up to what you were just talking about, um, as we look at that as an incurred cost to the district, um, is there any sense, I'm guessing not yet, but is there any sense as to whether we will be able to put our own program in place to avoid that cost or if the only option for parents who want to go to remote would be to go to that state piece. Um, I'm just no. seeing if we get a large number of families going out. Um, yeah, so. um, I don't, I, I guess I'm optimistic there will not be a large number of families going out. I also wonder about the cost to have 
a hybrid or in-person, and then also having teachers do triple the amount of workload in managing the remote. So it's, it's easier, not it's easier, but it, it's the, the continuation of say, say um, you know, hopefully not everything will go smoothly, but if we had to close the school down and move into remote, then, then you, you switch all the teachers into that remote platform. But at, from the, the get-go, if you have teachers trying to toggle between hybrid and in-person, and now you've just add remote to that, we would certainly have to expand our teachers and the capacity, and that would absolutely have to be impact bar ne negotiated. So, so I would say, um, you know, if that option is up in the fall and, and it's a good option for people, they can certainly take it. We still have to do our own um, remote learning, but um, cost-wise, I, I don't know. I, I would say it's, it's going to be one or the other. They did say it would not be a huge financial burden on the district. And again, they keep saying level funded plus, and they're talking more and more about some, and I do, I do think that's another reason they're asking people to hold off because they, they're in the works as far as um, allocating additional funds to districts. So if you were a district who was um, wanted to kind of implement this plan, but you didn't have the money, um, there could be some potential um, funding coming down the pipe. Thank you. And Linda? I know that we haven't talked about it much tonight, but is there going to be a survey or something sent out to parents, whether they're going to opt out of the bus or not? Um, I don't know what we'll include for information regarding buses. We'll have to talk with Brian about that. Um, it's hard because they haven't, Kyle, do you know of any updates about when they are going to release this, this information? Because this is probably one of the biggest pieces that they have not given us anything about. Right. I don't have a sense right now. I couldn't say when they're going to be releasing it, but in terms of the survey, uh, one of the challenges is we don't know what options we'll be able to ask the parents or we don't have a good picture of what the busing will look like so to ask the parents which option they'd want to go for at this point of time would be challenging uh, we did have a a meeting with nrt bus on friday uh, just to maintain open communications they provided us with some documents on the safety protocols uh, that they've been taking uh, but uh, to get back to the uh, all that said uh, we don't really have a good feel yet for what what the state is going to say that transportation has to look like yeah. i As will say to you, said, Linda, unless they waive it um there is a state requirement right now that we have to plan for the kids to ride the bus whether they intend to ride it or not that's um so I, I'm, maybe they'll consider waiving that i would hope they would consider waiving that or lessening that but um if even if a parent tells us that their student is ride, isn't riding the bus, we still have to plan for it at this point. We have to include them in our totals. Yeah, I, I figured that, but I figured that the state would be giving some kind of leniency towards that, hopefully. Um, hopefully. Has they talked about giving extra money for transportation? Because if they're going to go every other seat, you're not going to be able to fit all those kids on the regular buses. Right. So the one thing we talked about with our, our bus provider is if we did have to do double the runs, would we have to pay double the cost? And they came out and said that, no, that is not the case. Uh, nothing was settled on, but it would be some so develop some sort of additional hourly rate because the figure built into our contract, there's the, like we were discussing in the, in the spring when we were talking about negotiating down that total price where we got the what was it, 22% discount. Uh, there's certain fixed costs built into that fee structure. So it would just be the, the bus driver's hourly rate that would we would then have to pay for. So uh, we've been chatting with them about the, the cost perspective as well. Thank you. Uh, but in terms of uh, additional, additional grant money for transportation, I'd, I'd be surprised, uh, especially where as a district, but because we're a regional school district, we do get uh, the regional transportation uh, reimbursement from the state. Uh, there's been, I don't know if I want to say to level open talks, but it's commonly, it's the common belief right now that that reimbursement rate will probably will be significantly less than it has been in the past. 
Oh, so come on, Kyle. It's supposed to be 100%. I, I could not agree more. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I will say when we've been talking to our legislators, um, they have signaled that that's one thing that could take a cut. So, um, you know, mm. obviously, I know it's only 85 already. Um, I believe Representative Hill, if I remember correctly, said that it went down into the 60s, 60% uh, reimbursement rate um, area back in the Great Recession, and that's what he's kind of benchmarking against right now because it's what they have to benchmark against. So, I mean, you know, it, we don't know until we know, I guess, but there's a, there's a chance that we're going to be looking at reductions there. And I will say internally, we're, make, we're cognizant of all of this and we're planning for all of this. Thank Optimistic, you. but you know, planning for the worst type of thing. All right, um, any further questions? Linda, do you have another one or was that a leftover? Oh, let me get on the hand. Okay. Did you see someone else's hand, Kim? No, I would just lowered hers. Okay. <laughs> if, you've ever no if you've done a Zoom meeting, there's a lot of buttons here. Yes, there are. I'm getting quite good at it, but. <laughs> All right, so assuming that everyone is done with Kim's presentation, now that hopefully everyone who is listening is sort of up to the same speed that the school committee is, um, obviously it's not gonna be everything since we've been meeting weekly and kind of discussing this as it goes on, but there was also new information for us tonight. Um, I'm gonna open public comment guidelines. Um, I'll just note the, well, I'm gonna read both of these, I guess, but, um, but public comment is for statements. You can speak to the committee. We don't have the option to speak back to you. Um, again, I'll give you the email addresses at the end of the meeting for sending in um, feedback if you don't want to give feedback during public comment, or um, if you would have some uh, questions that should go to um, uh, or are on the reopening, I can give you that as well. So this is, it's literally your comments to the committee. Um, the next item on the agenda is public comment. Members of the public, the meeting host muted you as you entered the meeting. If you would like to address the committee, please indicate now that you would like to do so, either by raising your hand on your video call, using the raise hand option on the participant screen, or using the chat option. The meeting host will unmute you so that you can address the committee. Please refer to the public comment language on the agenda when making your comments, and remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. When you have finished speaking, the meeting host will mute you again. I'm just going to take a, a second to read the, um, the oral communication communication statement that's on the uh, the agenda as well. Members of the public may address the committee for up to three minutes longer with the permission of the chairperson. The committee will not engage in a discussion on topics raised during public comment, but may choose to add the topic to a future agenda. This agenda segment will be limited to 15 minutes unless extended at the discretion of the chairperson. All right, so I'm just going to go down the list. Um, Elena is first. Elena, if you could, um, Kim will unmute you, I believe. Yep, there was one before that. Hold on. I'm going, sorry, I'm going down the list that I'm seeing. Oh, OK, gotcha. Um, are you good? She should I think so. Yeah, I can. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I am. <clears throat> actually on in on some of these meetings um, with the opening committee and I just have to say that everybody is working together really hard to come up with um, a imperfect solution to a problem that none of us ever anticipated and as a parent um, of a elementary child and as a parent of a child going into middle school you know there's there's no there's no happy balance for any of this but I have to voice my concerns about what happens on the days that children are not in school. And I can tell you that from speaking to other parents that it wasn't just that we were thrown into a situation that we didn't know how to handle both teachers and parents. It's that parents have to go back to work. This isn't like the spring where the government and the state was shut down and the, the federal government in, in a, on top of the unemployment that people were able to get is giving an extra $600 a week. All of that at the end of this month is going to stop. So parents 
who have to work to support their families are not going to be able to go to their employers and say, hey, my kid's on group A this week, so I can only work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I understand that there is this need for hybrid. However, if these parents are then on the days where their children aren't going to school looking at other childcare options, you're exposing children to more people and you don't know who those people have been exposed to. And then you're going to bring them back into the classroom the next day and potentially expose you know, them <laughs> to all these other germs that they got on the days that they were being taken care of by childcare providers. There's a reason right now why camps aren't open. They don't have the PPE. They don't have the staff. They don't have the ability to make the accommodations. And my fear is that if you don't keep these kids in groups together, either on um, school days that are maybe less hours or bringing them back, you know, Monday, Tuesday, everybody, um, maybe an at-home learning day Wednesday, and then bringing them back. Thursday, Friday, um, that you are going to lose a portion of these kids. I understand that your accommodations are going to be made for your most at-risk children, but those are the only the most at-risk children that you know of right now. It is going to take longer than two weeks to assess what these kids have lost, especially if you're only bringing half of them back at once. There is no easy way to do this, and I, and I don't envy anybody who, who has to make this final decision, but I will say one thing. It seems like we are going to be forced to go into a hybrid model if the committee votes to keep a six foot distance. I think that if it's going to be a six foot distance, um, I understand that we're not supposed to be, you know, really contemplating this, but I'm, I'm hoping that there's an ability to bring young to bring the younger kids back and find a more hybrid model for the older kids who can be more self-directed learners at home who do, whose parents don't have to rely on child care providers. There's got to be a better way than splitting these kids up and exposing them even more. All right. Thank you. Uh, Noelle is next. And I apologize. We had um, Elena's full name. Noelle, if you could provide your last name as well when you, um, when you start your three minutes, your speech. Hello, Noelle Caterino. Um, we are part of the NES community. My daughter is in the second, will be starting the second grade. Um, thank you for taking my comments. This is my first time joining, so um, learning the rules slowly. I just wanted to make the comment, and, and I did forward this to the reopening um, email address, but I, I figured I'd, I'd get it part of the, the minutes or as the comments. Um, after listening to the discussion about the hybrid model of the AB schedule, I, I am a full-time working mom, so I kind of echo Elena's re, um, remarks. However, I do have a child that could be considered at risk, but my concern is the children being, being in masks for the entire school day. So I have a seven-year-old. She actually tolerates her mask rather well. But for an entire school day, I don't know how well that's going to be. There have been the Facebook videos of, you know, the, the teachers showing what will happen with the younger students with the masks that are pretty funny, but probably accurate. Um, and I just wanted to put it out there as a possibility of having half of each class attend in-person learning, um, where they will get the attention from the teachers and half the class then be on a Zoom or a remote platform um, during the same time. And then they would switch in the afternoon. And I realized this probably causes um, maybe transportation issues or something like that. Um, again, I, I'm kind of new to the conversation, so I haven't really heard everything. But the things that that might alleviate are, um, one, the children being in school in masks for the whole day. Um, it will keep their social groups smaller. Um, as Elena was saying, if we have to look at then having childcare afterwards, then are you just opening it up to a larger social group um, and maybe a contagion spread? I don't know. Um, and it would, again, I think our problem at home was not so much the worksheets and the apps as much as it was the projects and, and I think the teachers have a very specific role and the children respect them for that and they need that guidance that direction and that authority figure to help them with those projects and then 
you know, parents, grandparents, whoever it is that would uh, assist with the remote learning can help them on the flip side. Um, that's just my opinion that, that I think for a hybrid model, maybe that would work. Would it be a hardship on the parents in terms of childcare afterwards and, and things like that? Maybe, but at least it would be a consistent schedule. The children and the teachers would be in school Monday through Friday, just like kindergarten. They'd be in there half of the day, whether it's morning or afternoon, and then they would have the rest of their hours remote. So um, thank you for taking my comment. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Larissa Balin Wheeler has okay. asked to. Oh, go ahead, Balin. Hi, everyone. Oops. I just want to thank you all, first and foremost, for all the time and care that you're putting into this. I can't even imagine the work in these unprecedented times. And just like you, you know, we're all trying to. Um, stay calm and set expectations. So, so my request would be, you've put so much great work together each week that I've been on these calls. I see the momentum. And I think a key, I, I mentioned this in, in chat comments last week, is, is being upfront in communications with the community around this is a changing landscape. You know, if things surge, the plans could change but setting expectations about what the scenarios could be and high level timelines for when information will be shared would be so key in helping to alleviate some of the frenzy and swirl that's going on right now. And I know we haven't had a chance to hear about, I would not expect extracurriculars to be happening, but I am gonna say I'm really concerned to see the amount of, um, contact sports taking place with some of the student athletes, especially at the high school level, um, without masks and photos and those folks then coming back into a classroom and potentially, you know, spreading this um, since there are different scenarios around that. And I think at a certain point, information around that um, and just giving parents the information that they need to make informed decisions around what option they choose and around this new online program that you just referenced or the state-sponsored program or whatever Triton would do to complement it would be key. And then you'd have everybody else in your corner too because again, you're doing great work. So thank you. And those are just a few things I wanted to put out there. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Sorry, I'm just trying to scan comments, videos and the participants list all at the same time. I am not seeing any others. All right. Um, so let's move into the, um, I guess, bulk of the meeting now. So the frequently asked questions were sent out to you. Gosh, it would have been Friday now. I feel like all the days are just merging together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that would have been, you would have received, I, I sent out the frequently asked questions from the state and then um, I believe Brian would have sent out the frequently asked questions from the district. Are there any questions or clarifications from the committee on those FAQs that are needed? Sorry, I'm scanning as I go. Sorry, I'll scan too. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Yeah. Sometimes it helps us to have an extra set of eyes. I know. We're trying to look down a list and people are raising their hands and they're kind of raising their hands and the hazards of Zoom. Okay. So I'm not seeing any on there. Um, so I talked to Brian real quick. So again, um, the superintendent's on vacation, which is why he is not here tonight. A very much needed vacation. So um, happy to to have him taking his relaxation time so he can come back to us uh, fresh and ready to go. Um, but he had a couple of things that he did ask us uh, to take up tonight. And um, Alina referenced one of them, which is the three feet versus the six feet social distancing. Um, the state guidelines that um, were released on the 25th um, referenced um, six feet when possible, but a minimum of three foot distancing. Um, the committee has had some past discussion on this, so I'm reopening this conversation tonight with the hopes that we can take a, a vote um, as far as which 
direction we want to go because that is going to directly influence the reopening working groups work. Um, it's a it's a critical piece of information for them that will determine how they can move forward in their their conversations because it's it's going to change things drastically in the number of students that we can fit in a facility um, and the way that classrooms and cohorting would be done. Um, all of those things would be affected by this. So. I'm just gonna reopen this here. I'm sure given past conversations that there are people with strong feelings. Um, so before we go to the point of having a vote, um, I'd like to just hear from the committee again as far as where they're feeling on this, um, this particular topic. Maureen? All right, um, so last week I think I said that I was not comfortable with going to three feet. I've spent the past week reading and listening to different experts talk about it. Um, and one of the things that I, I heard that was interesting is about, um, it was a doctor that went in and explained how younger children, children that are, you know, pre-puberty, they're are studies, although not a lot of studies, that show that they aren't spreading the virus as far as an older child or an adult does. So I, I mean, I guess an argument could be made for the younger grades, the really little ones, that maybe three feet could be okay, um, but definitely not for the older population, perhaps middle school through high school, definitely. I, I think six feet should be this the standard for everywhere else why would we change that for schools um so that's sort of where i'm at right now okay thank you who else on the committee scanning as i go Um, Linda and Paul have their hands up. Nerissa. Thank you. I'm, well, up the, the, I'm the sorry. Story. Yeah, I'm like listening and going, wait a minute, I have a job to do. Sorry. Linda and Paul. <laughs> it takes time. I actually, my other laptop can hold like a wide number of screens and on this one I can only see nine videos. <laughs> so it takes me a while to page through the different pages. Well, um, I'm slacking. So I'll, uh, why don't Linda go first and then Paul Goldner second. Um, I agree with Maureen because uh, I think at the high school you're going to need more than three feet just because of their backpacks. Their backpacks are going to take up like a foot, foot and a half as it is. Um, I, Did we lose you, Linda? Yeah. Did we lose your audio? She froze. Lost everything, I guess. Oh, oh she's, she's back. back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. It's just, I, I understand the situation that's going to happen at the elementary school if we push for the six feet. And I think it's going to be hard to keep those younger kids away from each other all day long if you're making it six feet. So I agree with Maureen that it, it probably should be a three foot at the elementary school and at the middle and high school and on the bus, six feet. Is that the end? Yes. Okay, thank you. Paul Goldner? Yes. I saw last week um, an in-home childcare facility for you know, young children, um, a small child was sent in asymptomatic, um, didn't know that the child had COVID, and four families were infected, um, including uh, the infant uh, was infected and was not seriously ill. Uh, 16 people altogether from one small child going into an in-home facility. And to me that, in all of the things, it's the smoking gun as to why three feet is just not okay. 
we're not going to be able to trust that the children coming in are healthy and they are spreading it. So much of our data is from when Paul, I think we lost you. I can see your lips moving. I just can't hear you. Can you try muting and then unmuting? Sometimes that helps. Yeah, I froze. Oh, there you go. Can you just repeat? I think it was about like the last sentence and a half that we lost. Oh, I just, it, to me, it, that case is the smoking gun, really. Children will come into the building sick and they are spreading it, whether they're symptomatic or not. And so we need to keep that distance. Otherwise, our small children are going to be infecting each other as well. Right. I'm six feet for everybody. Six feet for everybody. All right. Erin. Um, Hi. Um, I am in agreement with Paul on three feet not being enough, uh, especially at the lower grade levels when we're not having a requirement for kindergartners or first graders to have masks. The only opportunity we have for them to try and maintain some of that distance is keeping them a little bit further back from each other so that when they do start encroaching on each other's space, we're not looking at a three foot distance, we're looking at a six foot chance for them to not spread. And I, I continually hear people say that children are not spreading the germs, but or getting sick from it. But they're still bringing they're still bringing germs home to people that can be affected by that. Um, as well, um, when we get into the older grades, we need to consider that they're probably going to be eating lunch in the classroom. So if we have them at the three foot distance, and they're required to wear a mask unless they're six feet apart you can't have them take the mask off to sit down and eat their lunch. They need to keep it on if they're not maintaining the six feet. So we'll have a problem right there with, with getting them to, to eat at school. Um, I also have concerns over um, you, you know, those distances with making sure that the teachers stay safe and the staff stays, stays safe. Uh, and I think that the six foot, given the fact that the CDC, despite the pressure, the political pressure that they're being faced with right now, is still maintaining that six feet is what should happen. All right, thank you. Uh, Tina. Hi, guys. I would say in terms of voting, I agree uh, with the majority in terms of I would um, agree with the six feet being the safest, but, but the reality is even with going with the six feet for planning purposes, um, there's no guarantee, especially with at the younger levels that you're gonna be able to keep the kids um, apart from each other. I just don't think, I, it's a logistical nightmare. I just don't think it's gonna be safe. I mean, the safest thing to do would be to keep everyone home and that's my general opinion, but coming to a vote, I would recommend six feet as well. Okay. Um, who hasn't spoken yet that would like to? Anybody? Paul Mayette, Paulise. Well, so I haven't I seen yet. Caitlin, Kaylee. Go ahead, Kaylee. So I'm torn because personally I'm for getting as many people access to the best education they can. But from the high school point of view, there, it's impossible to only take up three feet of space with a backpack. And at the elementary school point, it's impossible to keep kids from moving around. Every kid will like jitter in their seat or lean and that little kid movement is going to be one of the hardest things to mitigate. So I'd say larger than a three feet, just because there's no way that you can only take up three feet. All right, thank you. Anyone else who hasn't spoken yet? All right, 
um, seeing, sorry, let me just can't scan the participants list too. All right. Um, so I would say um, I've looked at all the science as well or as much as I can find because there's a lot of it that either isn't applicable to kids right now or um, seems incomplete or very small. And I am, um, I am in the six feet camp as well. Um, my hope would be, I mean, one of the discussions we had previously was if you go to six feet, does that necessitate um, having a hybrid model? Um, I don't, I, I mean, I guess we're gonna have to wait and see now that we know that this remote option should be available to everyone and that people could opt to go in that direction instead. I don't know if that's gonna change things. That was something that wasn't in play the last time that we had this conversation. We thought that only um, students that had um, a medical reason to go to remote would have that option. Now we know that, that everyone is going to have that option. Um, so I, I'm hopeful, I mean, I would, I believe that I believe that there are childcare issues that, as much as we can, we need to help with. They're they're going to be difficult, right? There are going to be, you know, issues with students who need to be in school as much as they can, and we need to get them there as frequently as possible for a wide variety of reasons. But for me, this keeps coming back to safety of students and staff, and I think that. Um, that when I come to a safety um, as, as the, the primary priority, the, the, the main thing that we have to look at, I believe that six feet has to be where we're at because looking at the new um, World Health Organization who was looking at you know um, airborne evidence of the virus, they were the ones that were chiefly championing the three feet previously. Um, I'm anticipating that airborne may change their um, their guidance there, or at least call it into question. Um, and the CDC is still strongly calling for, for six feet. So, um, you know, I, I think that having looked at that and looking at the research source articles that lie behind that, I, I believe that we need to stay at six feet for the safety of both our students and our staff. And everything else, we're gonna to have to do our best on, but the first thing we have to do is keep our students and staff as safe as possible. And, and I believe this is the, the, the main step that we need to make in that direction. I think I saw a hand. Nope. Nope, no hands. Nope. All right, um, so I need a formal and a, oh, sorry, is that a Paul Goldner hand? Oh. No. That was just a face thing. Okay. I, I, it, I had a response, but it's not relevant right now. Okay. Sometimes it's really hard to tell whether people are touching or, you know, what they're doing. Um, so I need a motion from someone. I'm going to go in the direction that I heard most of the responses. Um, can I get a motion for the school committee to recommend to the reopening working group that they use six feet social distancing as the basis for the guidance that they are uh, formulating. I will make that motion. I'll second. I guess a second. Was that Aaron on the second? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, um, any further discussion? All right. And I need a roll call vote on this. Um, Aaron. Yes. And Paul Goldner. Yes. Maureen. Yes, I'll support six feet. Uh, Caitlin. Yes. Paul Lees. Yes. Linda. Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, Paul Mayette. Yes. Tina? Yes. Okay, and I'm a yes as well. So Kim, I will trust you to take that back to the reopening group and okay. um, begin working on that guidance. And I would say, I know you're doing as much as you can in this direction already, but obviously anything we can to do with it to assist with all of the other issues that are now impacted by that decision, you know, yeah. anything we can do, I think we need to do. 
we'd have to do another feasibility study. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Lees. So I just, you know, we've taken that vote and, and I stand by what we've all said collectively as a group, but I don't think that that should be taken by the working group as um, a signal that they're to stand down from any one of the three plans that are. Oh yeah, proposed. no, we, we're not gonna stand down, we can't. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah, and to be fair, I mean, we have no idea what September is gonna bring, right? So it's a plan with three models. Yeah. That's what it's gonna be on the 31st. and. I don't know exactly, you know, when that final decision will be made, hopefully sooner than later. But, um, but you know, for right now, it's going to be a plan with three models, right? Yeah, we have to. Yep. Exactly. All right. Um, one of the other things that we were just doing a, a, uh, a quick, I'm going to reference this, I guess, is communications. Um, Kim already briefly touched on the survey. If there are any additional questions, we can go back to the survey at this point as well. Um, but the other thing I had talked to Brian about was doing some sort of um, live feedback because I believe that there are parents um, and probably students as well and community members. I mean, this is a wide reaching uh, decision that we're eventually going to have to make at some point down the road. So I expect there are a lot of people that will want to have input. And um, we're looking at options at um, having some sort of a live session or a, probably a, a extensive series of wide sessions for people to be able to provide some live feedback on that as well. So um, look for that and it'll be coming out. I was hoping to have some solid information for you tonight, but um, it doesn't look like that's coming. So it'll be a survey next week and then um, we'll get live sessions going, you know, as soon as reasonably possible. Erin? Narissa, do you mean like a town hall session, the interactive town hall session? I can't, I can say I don't know exactly what what um, what format it will take yet. Um, I've been discussing this with Dorothy Presser, who's our MASC field rep. I've talked to Brian about it. I've talked to Kim about it. Um, town hall style is by definition wide open. And I think I've heard a lot of concerns about, um, you know, when you have, uh, we, we know this happens, right? When we have public hearings, you have 20 people that show up and six of them speak, right? And the other 14 sit in the audience and watch. And I think there's a level of fear when you're dealing with these public, public speaking in front of a large group. And I think we need an option to be able to hear from anyone who wants to speak with us in a format that um, it, they're comfortable in. Uh, we're never going to be able to have one-on-one -on -one meetings, right? That's just simply unrealistic with the whatever 2,500 students in the um, district and all of their families and even potentially beyond that because I have definitely heard from community members who have said, you know, I have concerns about this too because if if students are in school, this is the, what, the impact that I can see on my business. This is the impact that I can see on my, you know, I, I'm a grandparent. This is the impact I can see on my family. This is the impact I can see, you know, it, it's wide reaching. Um, and I think going one-to-one -one is never gonna be an option to be able to do that. So I think the goal is to be able to get some more comfortably sized groups uh, and we need to figure out what that's gonna look like. Does that help? I don't have a lot of information to get you. If, if yeah, Brian I guess I was I was just really essentially thinking, asking if it was a back and forth or it was a listening session. Yeah, no, the, um, so we had talked about a public hearing and, and that was the concern, right? Is that there are people that we simply don't hear from in a public hearing. So it wouldn't be, I don't think it would be drop-in style because we never want it to get to a point where it's unmanageable on Zoom, having a discussion, we want to, keep it somewhat manageable so but I don't know exactly what that format's going to look like yet um, if Brian hadn't been on vacation I think we could have probably hashed it out by now but I am trying to be respectful of his time and he is definitely you know uh, enjoying his time away with his family and it's well deserved so I don't infringe on that any more than I have to so Paul, Paul has his hand up oh sorry go ahead Paul I just put it up so I just wondered, are we going to at some point have a discussion about um, an email that I saw from the Mass Teachers Association about their role in this? Because I, I think it's pretty significant and predominant, and I don't think it's anything that we should overlook. 
Yeah. I mean, we can definitely talk about that. My understanding is that that release was mainly about their discussions with Desi at this point. It's not about um, the individual negotiating parties, uh, but we can definitely have a conversation about that if you'd like to. Yeah, I didn't mean for now. I just mean in the future. That's all in the near future. We should probably, as, as their plans develop, we certainly have to bring that into the loop because that could have a strong Absolutely. bearing on, on what we do. Yes, yes. So um, just just by way of background for kind of uh, everyone else that's on this call, the Mass Teachers Association, Admin American Federation of Teachers, Massachusetts branch, I think they're called, um, and the Boston Teachers Union issued a uh, joint statement, I guess I would call it, um, with a list of uh, their reopening, um, goals, I guess I would call them. Uh, they stated that they were, they called them, they, I believe they said handling them like negotiations, um, having discussions with the Commissioner of Education for Massachusetts. Um, I heard the Commissioner on Boston Public Radio confirm that, that he was in fact meeting with them and having um, discussions with them. Uh, Obviously, that's kind of interesting because we're the negotiating body for our local unions, and there technically is no uh, negotiating happening at the state level. Um, so I'm not sure where that's headed. Um, there was guidance in there for the local units to be taking up some negotiations along that line as well. Our uh, local union um, has um, requested that we open negotiations for a mem memorandum of understanding for the fall. Um, we hadn't done that for the spring. Uh, obviously, things are <laughs> significantly different than we anticipated they would be when negotiating the last contract. Uh, so um, a memorandum of understanding, I think, is a, is a good idea at this point to make sure that we're all on the same page for going into the fall now that we're in a um, uh, less of a reactive, I would say, and um, I would say we're, we're planning with intent right now, right? It's not a uh, we need to put out a fire here, there, and everywhere and um, kind of ramp things up two weeks at a time. We're in a true planning period now where we can make it come intentionally to make um, make some plans for the fall. We don't necessarily know what that's going to look like yet, but um, but uh, Paul heads the Personnel and Negotiation Subcommittee and they'll be talking to the Triton Regional Teachers Association. And actually, while we've been in this meeting, uh, I also just got an email from the, um, from the uh, TRIAA uh, union as well that they would also like to open uh, an MOU so, or negotiation. So those conversations will be ongoing as, um, as uh as we go through the summer and um they'll i'm sure need to adapt based on you know where we where things go as far as the virus caseload goes and where where it looks like we'll end up with the fall and all the plans that we're making along the way so does that answer that question all right um is there anything else before we talk about schedule Without Brian here, we didn't want to make any big decisions tonight. So a lot of this was updates, discussions, three foot versus six foot. But we need to make plans um, going forward down the road because we do have to um, vote to approve the uh, plan before it goes off to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on the 31st. So we're trying to make plans for further discussion because we are still awaiting a gu the guidance and um, as well make, um, make plans for being able to see and approve that um, that uh, plan. Anything else from the committee? All right. So seeing none, um, Kim and I talked about this earlier today, and our um, recommendation to the committee would be that we meet um, next Wednesday. Part of so that would be the twenty second. Yeah. So part of the hope for that would be that um, that we'll have that additional guidance. Um, we know that Desi had um, said that they would release the guidance on transportation, um, sports, calendar, all that stuff um, mid to late July. Now that they've set the 31st is the date that the plans are due, I, I'm hoping that those will come sooner than later because we're going to 
districts need reaction time, and I'm sure that they are well aware of that. Um, so our hope was that um, if that's coming out in the near future, that uh, that would come out before the 22nd, and we would be able to have a discussion on it then. The next date that that would typically put on our calendar um, would be Wednesday the 29th is the next meeting. Um, I don't know how the committee feels about this. I'm definitely open to change, but I was uncomfortable with the idea of potentially seeing the plan on Wednesday, um, the 29th, knowing that it was due on Friday the 31st and not having the option to schedule a follow-up meeting if we felt like it was necessary. Um, I know often we, um, don't haven't liked in the past to be handed something at one meeting um, and being asked, to, especially if it was something significant, um, to vote on it at the same meeting. So um, my recommendation and, and Kim's recommendation, she would have the um, the plan done in time for a meeting on the twenty seventh. Um, we could meet the twenty seventh to go through the plan and then meet on the 29th to take a vote um, if um if the members were were most comfortable with doing that we could also have the option to meet on the 29th and simply say that we're going to see the plan that night and also vote it but i based on the past i, I know the committee has been uncomfortable with those with big decisions where we're seeing it and voting it on the very same night so the recommendation that we're looking for feedback on then is a meeting on the 22nd to discuss uh, to go through what will hopefully be the guidance and we can always cancel that if we need to but I think it's good to have weekly updates on what's going on overall anyway because obviously there's a lot to cover um, a meeting on the 27th to go through the plan and receive any updates and then a meeting on the 29th which would again be updates and a chance to vote that plan before the 31st so that the administration would have plenty of time to get that um, that plan into Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and I hope you're approving, Mr. Lees, because part of this was for you. <laughs> well, no, I'm very much in favor of it. I mean, I can't think for a minute that we, we would be handed a plan on the 29th and vote it the same night. I mean, uh, I'm yeah. speaking to Dina Sullivan. I mean, that's just, that's crazy. Um, we don't operate that way, and um, it's just not the way we operate. But and there's one other comment I, I just want to throw yeah. out. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, confused with all the different guidances. We have DESE guidance. We have uh, information from mass teachers. We have MASC guidance, we have Commissioner Riley guidance. I can't keep it apart, but the mm -hmm. one thing that does come back to me again and again, and I just want to say this very clearly, is that uh, let's not get hung up on calendaring in 180 days and all that requirements, because what I read said, that's on the back burner now. Okay, let's not focus on that stuff. Let's focus on getting our plans put together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think what it will affect is, is potentially training, right? That's a big thing that we need to to focus on and calendaring is going to affect training because if we don't have that built in the calendar we have to figure out is um like that will be something we will have to go back to the table with the trta and and right we we've had a great relationship so far through this whole planning process which um has been favorable and, and definitely is going to help the situation um but i'm just looking at that timeline too because all of the different things that we have to bargain with them with we'll have to have those finalized before that 27th date as well so right i'm assuming that's not consistent with what brian was suggesting brian was suggesting that we meet later and not before the end of july but how do we but does that mean we create a plan that hasn't gone through the trta I think so. And that's why I'm saying keep our eye on what the uh, Mass Teachers Association right. is doing because I, I, our Teachers Association always does its own thing, but you know, the Mass Teachers is certainly helpful to us in terms of what they're suggesting. So I can double check this with Brian, but my understanding was that TRTA had eyes on the plan already by being involved in the working group mm -hmm. um, that they were they would raise issues if they saw red flags you know that's if true they issue, right they're going to raise it during the reworking reop sorry, sorry yeah. reopening group um meetings and then the negotiation is is separately separate essentially 
Um, that's basically saying that, okay, here's what we're going to do. What is it going to cost us in order to do it? So that's the bargaining component of it. So they don't have a choice, I guess, per se, because it's, it's just re relatively to what is it going to cost us, you know? So that would make sense, Paul, is why it could be held after the document. I'll, I'll double check on that, but that was my, that was my take. And it was going to be, I know the superintendent has said this in the past, that it was going to be largely impact bargaining. So. Yeah, and that's what I mean. It's mostly impact bargaining, which again, is not about, can we do this? It's about, okay, we're going to do this. What is it going to cost us? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I say, it, I say it differently. I don't say, what is it going to cost us? I say, right. how are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? Because when you say cost, my wallet gets, oh. No. <laughs> how are we going to do it? Not what's it going to cost. How are we going to do it? I'll take that. How are we going to do it? Yes, that's correct. All right. Uh, so uh, back to the schedule. Does anyone have concerns about the schedule? I mean, the, the one thing that we were looking at is we can always schedule something. And if, let's say, guidance doesn't come in next week and there's not a lot of updates, we could cancel that meeting and simply take it all up on the 27th. But if we don't have the dates on the calendar and an agenda posted, we end up putting ourselves in a bind with the open meeting law because it does require that we have to have that two business days worth of advanced posting on all our agendas. So we can always post and cancel. The issue is that we can't be a day away and try to post at that point. We, it's against the law. We, we can't do it. So does anyone have concerns with that schedule? I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads. I don't see any hands. All right, so that'll be our plan then. So it'll be the 22nd at 7 p.m., the 27th at 7 p.m., and the 29th at 7 p.m. And once we get to the 29th, I think we'll be in a much better place to know what our meeting schedule is gonna look like for August. I wish I could give you dates right now because I know that would be easiest for a lot of our members, but um, I don't feel comfortable not knowing what's essentially gonna come you know, down the road. Um, to let's say, you know, go, let's what our next to say what our next meeting date will be or or even try to set more meetings for August. Yeah. Okay, so seeing no concerns. Um, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion to adjourn. I'll Maureen. second it. Linda. All right. And I need a roll call vote to adjourn, please. Aaron? Yes. Paul Goldner? Yes. Maureen? Yes. Caitlin? Yes. Paul Lees? Paul Lees, did we lose you? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Sorry. I was going to say, you're the usually the one making the motion to adjourn. Yeah. Uh, Linda? <laughs> Now we lost Linda. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Paul Mayette. Yes. Tina. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Um, just real quick before I sign off, I wanted to give those email addresses one more time. So if you have questions for the reopening group, um, the reopening working group's email address is reopening at tritonschools.org. And the school committee's email address, should you have um, feedback, is school committee at tritonschools.org. Um, I would just encourage people to continue to reach out and provide feedback. You know, we're going to have to make the decisions the best that we can as we go along, but the more information we have in, able to, in order to be able to make those decisions, the better off we're going to be. So thank you all for your time tonight, and I will see you next Wednesday. Good night, everybody. Have a, night. Have a great night, everyone. Take care.